said, I'm Owen DeLong from Hurricane Electric. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about IPv6. One of the first things I'm going to explain is why this is important. Um, this was in 2011. We still had some IPv4 left in the IANA registry. Uh, today we're actually well out here. We ran out in 2012. Um, IPv4 is dying. Uh, it's been dying for a long time. Arguably, IPv4 was first put on life support when we started using NAT. Does anybody remember when we started using NAT? How many, of you, how many people here remember the network before NAT? A few gray beards, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Believe it or not, the internet used to work a lot better. It was without NAT. <laughs> um, we added NAT in about 1987, 88, something like that. And the internet has basically been on life support ever since. The way to get the internet off of life support and, and continue forward and be able to grow is IP version 6, okay? The reason is IPv4 has only 3.2 billion unicast addresses. Sounds like a really big number of addresses, right? There are 6.8 billion people on the planet. Figure we're moving towards a world where everybody has a laptop, a cell phone, probably a desktop at work and some sort of computer at home, and probably some sort of cellular device that also needs an IP address. Now, add to that power meters, gas meters, water meters, uh, all these oceanographic and other scientific sensors and all these other data monitoring applications, traffic cameras, traffic lights. Well, it's pretty easy to figure out that all of that plus 6.8 billion people using five addresses apiece, plus infrastructure, web servers, et cetera, is more than 3.2 billion addresses. So we are way short of addresses and have been for many, many years. Okay. IPv6, fortunately, gives us 340 undecillion addresses. That's an even bigger number. That's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th, for those of you that like scientific notation. For those of you that are not so familiar with scientific notation, it's 3.4 and a lot of zeros, <laughs> 38 of them to be exact. Okay? Now, this presentation contains a lot of text because it's primarily focused on what changes between the libraries for doing IPv4 only and for moving your applications into a dual stack environment where they speak both IPv4 and IPv6. And when you're talking about code, there just aren't a lot of ways to make it into cartoons. So there's a lot of text and I apologize for that in advance. All of the sample code that I'm going to show you is available at Hurricane Electric at this web URL. Um, if you've got a laptop or a tablet in front of you and you have internet access, you may want to view some of this uh, and follow along on your screen. Um, I started out changing all the variable names to make it easy to find things that used them. It's not as useful after you've done this once or twice, but it can be a, a useful tool the first time. That way you can go through and look for the old variable names and, and find the things that need to change. Of course, you go through the compile, repair, recompile process as usual, and test, debug, retest. You're all familiar with that, I'm sure. There aren't a lot of changes needed, especially in Java, and I'm not going to cover Java itself here because I'm not a Java programmer, I apologize. But one of the primary changes in the C library, and it propagates through to most other libraries, is AFINet becomes AFINet 6 for the address family. SOC adder in becomes a SOC adder in 6 structure. And there's a generic storage type called SOC adder storage that is sort of a union of those two structures. Um, mostly you get the same structure members and constants. It's just the address size that changes. There are a lot of possible gotchas along the way. Um, things you need to look out for. User interface components, IP addresses in log files, IP addresses stored in databases, any place you're having to present an IP address to a user or get an IP address from the user, parsing routines, etc. If at all possible for parsing especially, use library functions and store things in a standardized format. UDP and ICMP are not covered in these examples, but they're not that different from TCP that you should have any trouble. If you've dealt with them in, in IPv4, it'll be the same set of differences for IPv6. Link local and scope and interface identifiers are new in v6. This is going to be something very, very different from v4. 
In v4, we had only one kind of address. We had global unicast addresses, and everything was a global unicast address. So-called private addresses in v4 are still global unicast addresses. It's just that we've changed the human semantics of those addresses to call them private addresses. A router doesn't know a private address from a public address. There's no difference in terms of, of actual software. In IPv6, there is a software difference between link local addresses and global unicast addresses. Link local addresses will not cross a router. A router will never accept or forward a packet to another interface that has a link local source or destination unless it is malfunctioning. Yes, there are broken routers out there that will do that. Link local is always FE80 slash 10, although some implementations treat it as slash 64. Um, but all of the addresses start with FE80 and are followed by the 64-bit suffix. There are also some implementation differences on different platforms in the handling of IPv6, v6 only as a socket option. Okay? Somebody back in the day misunderstood how um, v6 representations of v4 addresses called mapped addresses were handled and thought that they were a security risk on the wire. And so the BSD community decided that v6 only would be true by default on all BSD implementations and it has been thus ever since and in fact some implementations uh, that are even more broken will not let you set it to false. Um, Windows has followed the BSD lead on this so you need to be aware of that. The proper value is false by default which means that when you create a v6 socket by default it will listen on both v4 and v6 and accept either connection the software will see a v4 connection as a v6 mapped address. So your software only has to handle IPv6 connections at that point. It doesn't have to treat v4 connections differently. And the v6 address presented will be that the client end is FFFF, sorry, colon, colon, FFFF, colon, and then the v4 address. Okay. So now I'm going to get into the C porting example unless there are any generic questions. Okay. Um, refer to the source code examples if you have them available to you. Um, the easy part, migrating the server. Uh, you have to add one more include to your beginning of your file, uh, and that's netinet slash in.h. Uh, SockFD can optionally become SockFD6, and that's one of those variable renamings we talked about. Um, again, change your sock adder ins to sock adder in6. Update the initializations of desks in6. Uh, for the new members, change the arguments in the socket call, change the socket related error messages to handle the variable renaming, and then update the sock, set sock opt bind and listen calls also for the variable renaming. Don't worry, we're going to cover all this in the code in a minute because um, I know this is kind of dense right now. Uh, update the preparation for select uh, also due to variable renaming. Uh, the initialization of sock len changes. The call to accept is updated to, to deal with the renamed variables. And uh, then inet n2a becomes inet n2p. So name to ASCII becomes name to presentation. Um, the client, similar to porting the server, um, the less easy parts, you need a helper function, get ip stir to front end inet n2p because the different possible return structures from get adder info. Uh, replace get host by name and get serve by name with get adder info. Uh, this requires some effort, but the get adder info process is actually a lot cleaner uh, and it takes care of both of those calls in one call now. Don't forget to free the memory return by get adder info when you're done with it. Okay. Now to make the text density even better, we have eye charts ahead. What I mean by eye charts is some of these slides have a relatively small font, okay? So bear with, I'll do my best to try and make things obvious and point them out to you. So the IPv4 only version of the C uh, client, we have get host by name, and we have this inet adder call down below, and we have the get serve by name to look up the service. All of that, both of these slides worth of code, 
is replaced in the dual stack version with this small initialization and the single call to get adder info. So you actually get rid of a lot of extra code that way by using this much simpler call. In the IPv4 only version, um, this is actually very dense, and I, I'm used to seeing this on a 17-inch display. Um, the AFINet needs to change to AFINet 6, as we mentioned. Um, the connect call is modified, and the INET N2A calls are changed to INET N2P. So the resulting code, what's red, changes to what's green. Um, you can see there that the code is a little bit shorter, um, and it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. These are our helper calls to get IP stir. So, um, and the, uh, the get IP stir function definition is included in the sample code on the, uh, on the website. Any questions on, uh, on porting the server? Okay. Um, the easy parts of migrating the client, same variable name flagging, mostly update the same structure names and calls. Uh, get adder info will automatically return both the quad A and the A records. So you get V6 and V4 automatically with one code base. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and again, we mentioned that helper function. I think these slides got a little bit jumbled. So that covers C. Uh, any questions on C before we move on to Perl? All right. The, uh, the Perl porting example, pretty much the same as the, uh, the C example. Same basic software. Uh, socket 6 gets added to the modules used. Uh, that's roughly equivalent to the additional include in, IPv6, IP, in, the, in the C version. Uh, the get star by name calls again get replaced by get adder info. More on this on the next slide. Um, socket and bind calls, we need to change the protocol and address families. And there are minor changes to how we process incoming connections. By far the biggest change in Perl is the change to get star by name over to get adder info. Um, similar changes to the C port because it depends on the same underlying libraries. Uh, the C get adder info returns a linked list. Uh, Perl returns a straight list, but offset zero is the beginning of the first return. Offset five is the beginning of the second return, et cetera. So there's, there's a, a five element tuple in each section of the list that's returned. Um, that's very easy to process in Perl because you simply shift five elements off the front of the array each time you want to grab a new uh, tuple. Uh, there is a get you and get adder info. If you pass in in6 adder any, you don't get in6 adder any back. You get localhost back. I do not know why Perl does this. It's not broken that way in the C library, but I spent about an hour trying to figure out why I kept trying to connect to localhost when I was trying to bind anything and it wasn't working. So beware. Um, the old get serve by name, get proto by name uh, changes into all of this uh, in Perl to do the get adder info stuff. Um, part of that is that this is including some other pieces that are related, um, but it was hard to untangle it all. So the changes look more significant than they really are. Um, the IPv4 version of the socket and bind calls and the IPv6 dual stack version. As you can see, very few changes. Primarily PFINet changes to PFINet 6. And the bind call uh, changes to this $SATR variable, which is initialized back here. And that's why this actually expanded um, over here. Um, on the uh, socket or Sorry, the get host by adder, as you can see, that changes to get name info um, and unpack sock adder six instead of unpack sock adder uh, or sock adder in, which is the unpack function for v4. Uh, and then inet n to a changes to inet n to p. Uh, pretty straightforward. Am I putting everybody to sleep? Are there any questions? Anybody? OK. I'm going to assume you're all understanding this and that you don't have uh, any questions because I'm being ex extraordinarily clear. Um, if I'm doing something that's completely irrelevant, then tell me and we'll do something different. Um, the Perl client migration, very, very similar to the C client. Again, add the module socket 6, get adder info, replaces get star by name. 
uh, handling of AF INET 6 in the connection loop, and convert the INET into A's to INET into P, uh, and finally handle the protocol family in the socket call. So in IPv4, we kind of did this uh, um, get, a, get proto by name, get serve by name. In IPv6, that's all handled by the get adder info call. Um, in IPv4, we were able to recycle the socket, sorry, uh, for multiple connections because it was always the same socket type. In IPv6 or dual stack, we don't know whether we're creating an IPv4 socket or an IPv6 socket. So we have to create and destroy the socket or we have to create one of each and then cycle through using the correct one back and forth. Frankly, it's low enough overhead and you don't do it often enough. It's easier just to create and destroy the socket each time through the loop. So in IPv4, we created the socket outside of the loop and then we just did multiple calls to, uh, to connect. Uh, in IPv6, we have to move the socket creation inside the loop. Um, as you can see here, multiple calls to socket followed by a call to connect, uh, and then we close the socket if it, if it failed. Any questions on Perl at all before moving to Py Python? Bueller? Okay. Oh, good. Some laughter. Some people are alive. <laughs> Um, refer to the source code examples again for Python. Um, it's pretty much the same. I didn't bother renaming the variables because the Python port was really, really easy. Um, gut and replace get star by name as before. Uh, replace the default fatal error for a single attempt at binding with an iterative loop to handle multiple address families. Uh, and minor changes to how we process incoming connections because in dual stack they return a four tuple instead of a two element tuple. Um, the old way, we cr had to figure out our, our protocol with get proto by name and our port number with get serve by name. Uh, the new way, we have to call get at or info, and get at or info the way it works because it does DNS and stuff, it can return an exception. So, because Python isn't very good at ignoring exceptions, uh, we have to wrap it up in this try and accept stuff to, to make Python happy. Otherwise, it bombs out our code when DNS fails, even though we don't care about DNS. Um, the old way, we created the socket and then just kept, uh, you know, doing stuff to it. In the new way, we have to put all of that inside a loop and we need these try accept structures uh, because things can break uh, in order to handle the multiple protocol families. Uh, but other than the, those complications, the, the Python port was actually pretty easy. Um, we changed this host port tuple to host port flow and scope. Uh, and that handles getting back the flow label and scope ID from the, the packet header on the IPv6 datagram uh, when, when we get the incoming connection. Uh, this is parsing output from the accept call, which returns connection and address. Um, as you can see, the IPv6 compatible change is the additional elements returned in the adder tuple. Um, this is used to make the address presentable in debugging output and uh, user messages. Uh, the client migration was very, very similar. Um, basically, this was the old way. We uh, tried to connect over and over again until we uh, either ran out of things to try and connect to or we succeeded. Uh, in the new way, we have to create and destroy the socket each time because we can't try and make a V6 connection on a V4 socket and vice versa. Um, in addition, there are minor modifications required when the connection succeeds uh, due to the variable names in the print arguments. Otherwise, no code changes in Python. So Python was really, really easy. Now, here's the very good news for all of you as Java developers. For the most part in Java, you're going to be using a class library to do all of this. And you don't actually care about any of this low-level socket stuff. And so you get v6 for free, and your application is already completely ported in terms of the socket libraries. The bad news is you still need to address all of those user interface issues that I haven't talked about. Let me give you an example of how you can fail to do that, okay? There's a certain company in Palo Alto that makes printers. You may have heard of them, De uh, Hewlett Packard, okay? I have a Hewlett Packard 8600 printer. It has a V6 stack on it. I can get to its web control interface over V6. I can print to it over IPv6. I can create access lists on it to control which addresses can print to it and not. And those access lists can use predefined IP addresses that come in the printer hard-coded in V4 and V6. 
I can add new IP addresses to the available addresses to put in access lists as long as the address I'm adding is an IPv4 address. They didn't put in the user element, user interface elements necessary for me to be able to enter a v6 address to add it to an access control list. Okay, you gotta update the whole user interface. Any place the user puts in or sees an IP address of any form, you need to provide them the ability to deal with v4 and v6. Okay, any place you're writing addresses to a log file you need to realize that you may have to cope with a v4 address or a v6 address. Any place you are writing addresses out to a database, you're going to need to be able to write v6 addresses into that database. This almost certainly means you need to update your database schema unless you're using a very recent version of PostgreSQL where you've actually used an IP address type in your database. That IP address type will take both types of addresses. Most people that I know that have created databases in the v4 only world store them in the database as int32. You will not have much luck storing an IPv6 128 bit address in an int32 field in a database. One of two things will happen. The database will complain or the database will not complain but you will only store one quarter of your bits. Either way it's probably not good. In the slide deck, which should be available on the website afterwards, yes, no, yes, um, there are these handy quick reference cards. This is the function replacement guide. Left side you have the old function, right side you have the equivalent replacement function. The good news is the wor these work in almost every language because all of the other languages use the C library underneath. So the function names tend to be the same. Uh, the same thing with the structure replacement guide. So. Now let's open it up to your questions about IPv6 in general. Yes? Oh, well, I don't know if it counts about, as being about IPv6 in general, but since you did say that all of the languages are using the same C library as underneath support, why is there so much more trouble in handling the exceptions in the Python example? Because Python is obnoxious about exceptions. <laughs> it's just an artifact of the language itself. Uh, the question was, why is Python so much more obnoxious about exceptions? And the answer is because Python is so much more obnoxious about exceptions. Um, you, you would have to ask the, uh, the guy that's in charge of Python, I forget his name. Yeah, Guido. So ask Guido why Python is so obnoxious about exceptions in general. Uh, it's the reason I don't generally program in Python. Well, one of two reasons I don't pr generally program in Python. Uh, spaces having meaning being the other. White space is not code, damn it. <laughs> yes? So you recently reviewed the, uh, I guess, three signatures, four elements to the, uh, the stack. So, yeah. Well, there's four elements returned in the tuple from Python. Yeah, yeah. Um, and those are, instead of just the host and port that we got in IPv4, right. the IPv6 header contains additional parameters. It contains a flow label which is literally up to the application what value it wants to put in the flow label. So it's a field there that the application can use as the application sees fit. Um, and then there's the scope. Um, the scope will be either link local or global. And it indicates the address type. I'm not really sure why the scope variable is considered necessary since the scope can be inferred from the address. but. It's included there and unfortunately, again, a Guidoism, you can't just grab the elements of the tuple you want or the elements up to the last one you care about. If you try to read three elements from a four element tuple, Python will blow up your program. You have to read all four elements from the tuple or Python says, eh, -eh. <laughs> So more fun with Guido. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? There are more slides on the transition in general. Uh, we, they're not in this session. <laughs> we have an upcoming class that's an introduction to v6. It's not developer specific. It's actually oriented towards general IPv6 knowledge. And it talks about the basics of IPv6. It talks about the 
um, address structures and ha address planning and how to enable v6 on a web server and all the mail server and all that fun stuff so but that's a that's a paid class and it's a two-day class so in this evening's format we're trying to cover a relatively compact framework of developer specific things yes though I'm happy to answer other questions well just a brief history or sure a brief story would be great like sure we can do I can do that a brief story of IPv6. So IPv4 was created to handle a very different world. IPv4 was created to provide network access to a network that had outgrown the old uh, protocol known as NCP. NCP provided an 8-bit address, and it was more than enough addressing for the initial plan, which was one address per institution for their mainframe. And this was to support a few DOD installations and some universities and a few research and academic um, institutions. It outgrew that and they went to the 32-bit address because that would be more than enough to address all of these mini computers and microcomputers that were springing up at these universities and research institutions and government installations that were going to be on the internet. And there was no concept that the average person would ever be on the internet or want to because after all, the internet at that time consisted of FTP to transfer files and email. And we all know that nobody wants to use email other than researchers and the government. Don't forget Gopher. <laughs> this predates Gopher. Gopher was later made available on IPv4 and it was the beginning of the end for IPv4. Uh, Gopher, Waze, Archie, these were all ways to start searching the internet. This, this was the uh, kind of early uh, attempt to be able to make content more readily available to end users and provide static lists of information and index it and apply some library science to this growing and burgeoning amount of data that was now being made available uh, pre uh, up until this point over what was known as anonymous FTP. And what anonymous FTP meant was you had these archives sitting out in cyberspace that you could connect to and you would say username anonymous and your password would be your email address and it would say okay here's everything I've got and you're welcome to download it. Um, it was a very kind, gentle, kinder gentler world in many ways. Um, trying to make sense of all of that and find these archives was getting difficult so we created some library sciences and we started seeing things like Gopher and Archie and Waze. These were the precursors to what are now uh, known as search engines. Okay. Later, somebody came out with an even better way to represent all of that information and kind of unify all of these different protocols. And it was a tool that later became known as a web browser. The original one was known as Mosaic, and it was produced by the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. So in Gopher was like the late 80s, Mosaic comes in the early 90s. Yes. And then the rest follows. And then the rest follows. And that's when we started having the average end user care about the internet. And in the course of less than five years, we went from 99% of the people in the world not knowing the internet existed to what rock have you been hiding under if you didn't understand what a URL was? <laughs> okay, it happened really fast. But that meant we went from 100 million users worldwide almost overnight to 6.8 million target users worldwide. And so, it, it was kind of a rapid change. That meant we needed a new protocol. We've actually had IPv6 on the books as a specified protocol for more than 15 years at this point. Deployment has been rather slow. NAT has hurt us a lot in more ways than you probably realize. Number one, NAT hurts just in the ways that it breaks the internet. How many people knew the internet was broken before tonight? <laughs> okay. Um, you can actually judge how much somebody knows about how the internet works in detail in the under the hood detail sense of the word by what they're amazed about okay somebody that knows very little about the internet and its inner workings is amazed by all the things we can do with it video and voice and teleconferencing and web browsing and shopping and and all of this different stuff email instant messaging amazing somebody who knows how the internet works at its gory detail like me is amazed that it works at all. <laughs> okay. How many people know that there is no such thing as the internet? Not a single hand, one hand. The internet does not exist. 
what exists is a whole lot of little private networks and some large private networks who have all happened to agree to run the same protocol and many of whom have agreed to interconnect to each other and exchange packets in various ways. Okay? Any one of those networks can decide it doesn't want to play anymore and disconnect itself from the internet at any time. Any one of those networks can refuse to admit whatever packets it wants to refuse. Any one of those internet users can decide, I'm going to use this guy's addresses because I don't like him and I need address space. And there is actually no legal force anywhere that really prevents that. What prevents it is that his upstream ISP will probably go, dude, you can't do that. And if you keep doing it, I'm going to disconnect you. <laughs> So it is almost entirely run on cooperation and goodwill and handshake agreements. The entire internet is band-aided together by these handshake agreements and goodwill between multiple independently operated networks. There is no central authority. There is no central control. There are registries that provide a central location for coordinating numbers to be unique among cooperating entities. But the internet depends entirely on cooperation. Okay? Never before has there been such a large endeavor in human history where government intervention was not required and mutual cooperation was all it took. Yes? So that's a great way to say Okay. So the question is, how is my experience going to change if I flip from V4 to V6 tonight? And the answer is, you're going to experience a much smaller internet. You'll find that, as a general rule, the search engines and a few other websites keep working, and you get really great performance to them, and everything else disappears. The good news is you don't want to do that, and you don't have to. What you want to do is add v6 to your current v4 implementation so that you can run both protocols simultaneously. That way, when people start coming onto the internet as v6 only, as they're already starting to do in parts of Asia where they've been out of addresses in v4 for more than a year now, actually more than two years now, um, but you'll also be able to still talk to all of the legacy v4 network that's out there and still running on v4 only, uh, places like Yelp, for example. Yes? So just, just a follow-up to that rest of the internet. Well, I have good news for you and bad news. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. So the question is, how does this affect my security model that depends on NAT and private addressing in IPv4? There's good news and bad news. The good news is it doesn't really affect your security model if you're depending entirely on NAT because you don't have a security model if you're depending entirely on NAT. Um, NAT is not a security mechanism, okay? NAT is mutilating packet headers and it doesn't do anything for your security. What provides the security is the stateful inspection that says, does this inbound packet match an existing outbound flow that I've already seen or not? Now, the good news is that in order to do NAT, you have to have the stateful inspection operation anyway. So when you turn on NAT, you get stateful inspection kind of along for the ride for free. And for the most part, we forget about that. But now that we're starting to talk about the differences between v4 and v6, it's important to recognize that those are two separate components. And that stateful inspection provides your security and can be done without mutilating the packet header. You don't have to change the address to do stateful inspection. And in fact, back in the days before NAT, we had stateful inspection firewalls that did that without mutilating the packet header. Okay? So you don't really care about hiding your addresses nearly so much as you care about not permitting packets in that don't match packets you sent out. And you can do that with stateful inspection in v6 just like you're doing in v4 now. The difference is you have public addresses on everything and if you want to permit something to provide a service to the internet, all you have to do is create a rule set on your firewall that says permit this through even if it doesn't match. Okay? And so where do I get the addresses? Um, where do you get your v4 addresses now? Okay, but I bet you got them from somewhere. Uh, I'm going to guess nick.ddn.mil or nick.sri.net. Yeah. Somebody like that, yeah. Okay, so the successor registry in North America to those registries is called ARIN, the American Registry for Internet Numbers. 
And so if you have a direct assignment or allocation uh, from the old days, legacy address space, you would go to Aaron to get v6 address space. Um, or you can go to your upstream ISP like most people do for v4 currently. If you get your address space from your ISP today, you should get your address space for v6 from your ISP tomorrow. Okay. Hang on, let me address his question and then I'll come back to you guys. So his follow-up question is how do you do this at home? Well, if your ISP is ready for you to do this at home, it's relatively easy. You call them up and ask them to turn it on. If you're a Comcast subscriber, you're probably in pretty good shape in the Bay Area in terms of being able to do that if you have residential service and even business service, they're starting to turn that on now as well. If you are an AT&T subscriber, sorry, they, they haven't really learned to spell IPv6 yet. Um, if you're subscribing to somebody else, it's going to depend on what they say when you call them up and ask. I do encourage you all to call up your ISPs and ask. Assuming your ISP is not ready, you can go to tunnelbroker.net and use your existing v4 public address from your ISP as a tunnel termination point and run a v6 tunnel through our free service and get IPv6 that way. These gentlemen are ahead of you, but I will come back to you. Yes. Uh, Comcast is not charging extra for v6 and they're doing dual stack so you get a v4 and a v6 address simultaneously. Well, they're, they're going to hand you a slash 64 at least of IPv6. So you don't need to worry about multiple v6 addresses. You're still only going to get one IPv4 address unless you pay, for, pay extra for that. But to the best of my knowledge, Comcast is not charging for v6 addresses and they're giving at least a slash 64 to everybody. I think there was another, yes. It, it kind of, kind of follow on that, I, like, that, that you well, to okay, so I'm going to try and be very, very blunt here. Uh, the question is, what good is IPv6, basically? And the answer is, do you like the internet today on IPv4? Do you want to do without the internet on IPv4? Do you, do you want to go back to a world where you have no internet access? No, that's no. Okay, well, so the IPv4 internet is shrinking as a percentage of the total internet, and it will continue to do so. And within five years, it's probably going to be near nothing. Then IPv6 so is a good thing. if you want to continue talking to the internet, okay. you're going to need IPv6. Um, the other question was, I can ping everything in v6. Well. If you don't have a stateful inspection firewall in v6 like you do in v4, then yes, you can ping everything. If you turn on a stateful inspection firewall, it works just like your v4 stateful inspection firewall that you're using with NAT. The difference is it doesn't mutilate the packet header in that second step after lining up the flows. Okay. Um, I think this gentleman over here, and then I'll come back to you guys. Okay. Yes. Okay. You mentioned and, and in that case, you'll have to go back to the website and change your v4 address in the tunnel configuration. Well, that's no fun. <laughs> Call your provider and ask for a static address. I, I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, we, <laughs> we're limited in what we can do about that. Right? I mean. Well, then maybe it is too soon to go to IPv6. Well, or maybe you need to call your provider and ask them when you can get v6. And if they say never, you need to switch providers. Yes, actually over here was first. So can you say as a sort of truth rule and not, you know, translation over here? Yeah, that's not what I'm hearing from the ISPs. So I, I, I want to talk to you afterwards because there's something not lining up here between the story I'm getting from John Berzowski and what you're saying to me and, and some things sound very, very wrong there. Um, talking to Time Warner and Comcast and AT&T and several of the others about this multiple layer NAT stuff, they're all considering it a nightmare that they want to implement as little as possible. Right, but um, if one person at Comcast wants to do this, all others don't even want to listen about this. Just that's, one person that I, I No, I know, I know that's not true because I know several people at Comcast that are V6 oriented, okay? It may be that you're having a problem in this area and I want to talk to you about that because I want to make these people aware of it so that we can get it addressed. But I do know that at a high level, Comcast's corporate strategy is heavily V6. And Comcast management is fully bought into V6 at the, at the upper levels. So 
and I'm not here to defend Comcast. I personally dislike that company greatly. But <laughs> in this particular case, just like Microsoft, it's one of the few things they've done right. So, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of keep that going in the right direction, if possible. So I'd like to talk to you afterwards, if we can, offline, because I don't think that enters the rest of the group here all that much, and, and try and see if we can get your problems addressed. Well, any, any cable system is going to require a DOCSIS 3 modem to support IPv6. DOCSIS 2 is long since dead. It died five years ago. So if you're still running a DOCSIS 2 modem, it's time to go to Fry's and spend $30. Yes? So um, you mentioned free. So what, what yeah, you basically get it for free. You're basically, the class library should take care of all of it. And the question is, um, you know, if you've got an Android phone, what, what do I need to do to, to take advantage of V6? And the answer is, you need to find a provider and a phone platform that both support IPv6. Um, you know, he mentioned T-Mobile as, as not supporting V6. That, again, has not been what I've been told by the people I know at T-Mobile. So uh, I, I do want to talk to him more about that. Um, I know, for example, that I have V6 on my Verizon phone here, and it works perfectly well over LTE, over 3G. Uh, I get a slash 64 for the phone. The mobile hotspot works very well. It does full dual stack and no problem. So I've, I've been very happy with that since I upgraded to the iPhone 5 on Verizon and got V6 working there. Uh, on the other hand, my AT&T LTE service on my iPad, V6 fail utter and complete fail, and when I called them up about it, they utterly and completely failed to even diagnose the problem correctly. Uh, in fact, they went so far at one point as to tell me, quote, we don't support accessing websites over IP, unquote. <laughs> they did not have a good answer when I said, what do you support accessing websites over? <laughs> hey, so so AT&T failed. I'm sorry, I heard an over here. Oh, over the air, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so if you want to host the mail domain, right? So it would take V4 clients. Sure it well, so, so if you want to talk to V4 clients, you need a V4 address. Yeah. Which, whether, whether reverse DNS is involved or not, you can't talk to a V4 client from a V6 address. Okay, only a V4 address can talk to a V4 address. Only a V6 address can talk to a V6 address. There, there, there is different protocols as IPX and Apple Talk, okay? You can't talk from an IPX address to an Apple Talk address either. Okay, think of IPv4 and IPv6 the same way. They're IPX and Apple Talk. They're similar protocols. They support the same set of services, but they're different on the wire. They have different protocol numbers, different protocol version numbers, etc. Um, however, you can run a v6-only mail server if you want to. Or you can do what I'm doing and run a dual stack mail server where my mail server listens on v4 at 192.159.10.2 and on v6 at 2620.0.930.90.200.2. So, <laughs> or, or you can use DNS to look that up as mailhost.delong.com and you'll get both addresses. Yes? Well, no matter what language you develop in, you're going to need to support both for some time. Okay. Um, the good news is in Java, the class library should mostly take care of that for you, except for the user interface components and data structures and logging and other things where your application actually touches the addressing. So if you're writing a video game, you probably don't care. If you're writing a utility um, like the IPv6 toolkit on my phone that shows me the interface addresses and allows me to do DNS lookups and pings and things like that, then you're going to need to do a lot of work in the application to support presenting those to the user and accepting them as input from the user and logging them in whatever log files you keep, et cetera. Okay. Uh, yes? Magical performance increase. The magical performance increase is fiction. There is no magical performance increase associated with IP version 6. Um, the perceived magical performance increase comes from some people who have particularly bad IPv4 environments where, I don't know, they're, they're in India and they're natted six ways to Sunday or, 
you know, they've got multiple layers of NAT inside their office before they get to their ISP or whatever, and they bypass all of that with V6, they see a not so magical but actual performance increase that results strictly from moving a lot of extra hardware out of the way. Okay, V4 is on life support. It performs accordingly. Yes? Uh, just a quick comment, particularly if it's still like a readable identification. So, what he's pointing out is that as carrier grade NAT starts to come into play, and by the way, Verizon is already testing this under the euphemism address sharing technology. Um, they have allowed their users that don't want this address sharing technology to opt out of their trial. Um, so if you are a Verizon user and you've gotten the little letter about um, this wonderful new thing they're offering to improve your service with address sharing technology, uh, I highly recommend choosing to opt out. Um, you're going to be lumped into a single IP address on the public facing network with a whole lot of your neighbors and possibly several people up to three states away. Okay. Um, for example, as I understand the carrier grade NAT plan at a couple of major cable companies, they're going to have a NAT center in Denver that handles 11 western states. Okay. So, if you're looking for Yelp reviews and you're using geolocation to figure out what's near you, um, and you're not using the GPS data in your phone for the geolocation, but instead your IP address on the public internet, you may well get some very lovely restaurant recommendations in Denver. <laughs> Never mind that you're standing in San Francisco, your IP address is not, <laughs> okay? The other wonderful thing that comes with this, as he mentioned, is that you are sharing an IP address reputation with 3,000, 5,000, 8,000, 100,000 of your least known non-acquaintances, which means that if there's one spammer in those 8,000, 10,000, 100,000 people, however many you're sharing an address with, uh, all of the blacklists will blacklist that address. And not only will the one spammer in all of those people get blacklisted, but everybody will lose their ability to do anything on the internet as a result. So that's going to be a lot of fun with this address sharing technology as well. Uh, I believe he was next. Well, certainly st the, the question is, is this going to kill static IP hosting? And, the answer is this is going to make static IP hosting a whole lot more important uh, and a whole lot less available at the consumer level. Um, so for example, I have taken steps to avoid that problem. I have lots of addresses at home. I have commercial grade service from multiple providers. I do BGP uh, with my upstreams and I'm routing 768 public IPv4 addresses into my house that are mine to move to any service provider I want. Um, not everybody has that luxury and it's going to be a whole lot worse for the average consumer uh, before it gets better and that's a really good reason to move to IP version 6 where you should get relatively static addressing and you should be able to get lots of addresses um, and if your provider is not giving you uh, at least a 64 and more ideally a 48, um, you should be looking to change providers. Yes sir. That was the original design of the protocol, in my opinion. It, oh, the question is, weren't they supposed to be giving 48s to everybody, including residential customers originally? Wasn't that the original agreement or protocol or whatever? The answer is the original design of the protocol supported 48s for every end site, and I and a lot of other people still believe that's the right thing to do. Unfortunately, the RFC that said this is what you must do was deprecated in favor of an RFC that says ISPs like to make money and they like to do bizarre things to their customers and we're the IETF and it's not our place to dictate that they shouldn't. Guess who was at the, uh, at the meeting where that was all approved? Um, so the answer is I think you should still seek a 48. I think you should seek providers and reward providers that provide 48s, but not all providers are going to do that. Hurricane Electric provides 48s. Um, finding a residential provider that does IPv6 at all right now is hard enough. Finding one that does 48s on a residential level is virtually impossible and I don't know of any. Um, but I do encourage you when you talk to your provider to A, ask them to provide IPv6. B, let them know that if they fail to provide IPv6 relatively soon, 
you're going to be looking for alternatives and C, let them know that you fully expect them to provide a 48 of address space to you uh, and that you'll be looking for alternatives if they don't. Uh, I think he was first and then I'll come back to you. It really depends on the website. The question is what percentage of web traffic comes in on V6 for websites that are dual stack? Uh, it really depends on the website. Uh, Google's current numbers are, are saying 1% to 2%. Uh, there are some universities in Africa that are seeing 60%. Um, we're seeing numbers in between those two, um, and it actually varies a lot from day to day. So it's kind of all over the map. Uh, happy eyeballs makes it really hard to count on uh, those numbers being meaningful anyway. So in the back. Mm, defi do you mean uh, like TCP ports or uh, no? They're pretty much the same. The question is: Is there any difference in the handling of ports uh, between V4 and V6? And the answer is no. TCP is TCP, um, uh, and it's pretty much the same layer four protocol in V4 and V6. You can technically run TCP over Apple Talk if you try hard enough, and it uses the same port numbers there too. In the back. Gotchas, slide seven. Implementation differences in IPv6, V6 only, socket option defaults and availability. Yeah, and if you don't do that on the platform where you need to, then you need to tell them. Yes. You either have to create a V4 socket and a V6 socket and listen to both of them, or you have to set socopt IPv6, V6 only false if you're on a BSD platform or one of the other platforms that chose to follow the same brain death. On a rational platform, IPv6, V6 only should be set to false by default. But unfortunately, it is true on many platforms, including Windows and BSD and Mac OS. Yes? Uh, two, two points, I the subnet. You could Behind the router, yes. Yes. The router. yes, you should get a DHCP prefix delegation of a slash 64 or larger to your router but yes, your router gets a 128 address for its upstream interface, of course. It has to. Uh, second thing is, why, why would I need a whole 64 or slash 48 address space? I mean, well, you probably need at least one subnet, which means you need a 64, because a subnet should be a 64. Um, in IPv6, we don't count hosts, OK? We just give every subnet a slash 64, and that should be enough room for pretty much any subnet you're going to build. Anybody want to take a stab at how many hosts you can put on a slash 64? As many as you can afford, that's a good answer. Uh, an internet's worth, that's an almost good answer. How many grains of sand are there in the Sahara Desert? I don't know, but that's not a relevant answer. Okay? The simple answer is all of them. Okay? Technically, technically, the entire IPv4 address worth of hosts squared, okay, if you care about it in those terms. Uh, if you care about it mathematically, it's a little bit north of 18 quintillion addresses. You know, 18 quintillion, 368 quadrillion and change. Okay. Um, so many hosts that people ask me, isn't it a waste to use a slash 64 for a point-to-point -point link when it's only going to have two hosts on it? I find this question very amusing, and I respond to them, well, maybe. Is it a waste to put a slash 64 on a subnet where you're going to have 1,000 hosts? And they look at me kind of startled, and they say, well, no. And I said, well, OK, explain to me the difference between 18 quintillion, 368 quadrillion minus 2, and 18 quintillion, 368 quadrillion minus 1,000. You're wasting the same amount of address space either way. The difference between two and a thousand is completely irrelevant there. So it's okay. The protocol was designed to use 64s for every subnet. We have more than enough subnet numbers to handle the entire world and everything beyond the world that we know for plenty of years, okay? Even with using slash 64s on every subnet, it'll be okay. 
Trust me. Yes. I was trying to ask a leading question. I believe there's something called like router free address assignment where you take your MAC address, which is 48 bits. And you Stateless you address auto configuration okay. is the term you're looking for. Yep. Um, so what he's asking me about is, is why a 64? And he's trying to use that as a leading question to get me to explain stateless address autoconf, which I'm happy to do. The easiest way to assign IPv6 addresses to hosts is what is known as stateless address autoconf. Step one, configure a router with an IPv6 address and turn on stateless autoconf support on the router. Um, Depending on the router, there are different ways of doing this. Some routers, it comes on automatically by default. Some routers, you have to set an EUI64 address on the router interface. Some routers, you actually have to configure router advertisements. Um, it varies from router to router. But once your router is issuing router advertisements, the process of configuring an additional host on that network consists of two steps. One, plug it in. Two, turn it on. It will then get a v6 address and default gateway information. And if you've configured your router advertisements correctly, it might even get DNS server information through stateless autoconf. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Well, you should do the same firewall setting that you use in v4. You should set up a stateful inspection firewall with a default deny inbound any. Okay. Um, the, the question is, if I set up v6 on my network at home, what kind of security do I need? And the answer is you need the same kind of security that you've always needed in v4, which is a stateful inspection firewall with a de default deny any inbound. And then you can poke whatever holes in that you want if you want to set up any v6 services. If you don't want to set up any public v6 services, you're done. You just leave the default firewall there in place. Okay. For the first time, it's be the same area. Holes, unintended holes. There, there are unintended holes in that. You can spoof packets just like you could spoof them through the NAT and v4. It's the same set of holes. We've always lived with them. So nothing is new. Nothing is new. Everything that is new is old. Everything that is old is new again. <laughs> okay. The question was, what are the holes in that? And the answer is the same holes we've all been living with in v4 all these years. Any other questions, comments, rotten fruit, grapes? Yes. Speaking of old and new. So end-to-end -end kind of give it up on reading the world map. Well, so let me take you all way, way, way into the future. So far into the future that we're going to use technology that exists today. Imagine you go to the grocery store and you see a recipe you want to make for dinner. And next to that recipe is a QR code. You zap the QR code with your phone and their phone recognizes that that goes to the recipe I want to make for dinner application. And that app contacts your refrigerator and says, these are the ingredients we need. And the refrigerator has little weight sensors in all the shelves, and it has positional RFID sensors, so it can tell that the thing here is a carton of milk, and the weight tells it how much milk is in the carton, and it can tell where the carton of orange juice is and how much orange juice is in that carton and how many water bottles and all of that stuff. And your cupboards can all scan little RFID sensors on all the little cans of beans and peas and carrots and whatever else you have in there. And so your fridge and, the, and, and, and your pantries take inventory of what's on the list that's there, and they figure out what's missing, and they send back the shopping list to your phone. And this all takes place in seconds while you're standing there in the grocery store. And you now have a shopping list on your phone that you can continue your shopping with and have everything you need to make for dinner that evening and know what you had in inventory when you started. There's not a single piece of technology involved in providing that that does not exist today. Why don't we have it? We don't have it because we don't have publicly accessible fridge web servers. Not because it's hard to put a web server in a fridge. There are fridges with web servers in them now. We've had those for years. But because we don't have IPv6, and it's very, very hard to put public IPv4 addresses in households. Yeah, the RFID tags are still a little too expensive, and the weight sensors for the, for the refrigerator are still a little exotic. But Moore's Law says we'll have those in about five years at very, very cost-effective pricing. So I'm not too worried about that. Yes? Ah, but this didn't involve an iRefrigerator cloud service. Yeah, it comes to our device, you're right. It is local this, was, this was straight HTTPS from your phone to your fridge. IPv6 allows that. It gets rid of that need for the man in the middle. 
We don't need that intermediate cloud service host in the middle. That's only necessary because of this NAT crap. Okay? If you are using NAT, you are NAT on the internet. Yes? You said that there's a yes for everyone in this. Well, <laughs> multiple addresses per server does not eliminate the need for ports. Um, they're, they're, they're kind of unrelated questions in the ideal world. I realize that NAT muddied that water by using ports as part of the address, but going in the opposite direction, using the address as part of the port number or all of the port number, I'm not sure is a great idea either. Well, the beauty is that if you, uh, the question is if you don't know what your users are using and you're making these changes, how do you approach testing? And the first thing is, by and large, your users are going to be using DNS to get to your services. So you can do your initial round of testing by making your IPv6 addresses only known as IPv6 dot server name or something like that, which allows you to only have people that know about it test it um, by using that alternative name for the server. Theoretically, once you turn on v6 to the general public, your users shouldn't notice any difference between v6 and v4, and they shouldn't care which protocol they're using to get there. They should get the same user experience regardless of whether they connect over v6 or v4. The important thing is to provide v6 access to your support personnel and teach them how to troubleshoot when a user is having a problem that's related to which protocol they're using and how to identify which protocols your users that are calling in with questions are using so that they can help them. Uh, as an example, here's a great way to stump the average help desk. Call them up and say, um, I can get to the search engines, but everything I click to on the search engine doesn't work. What's wrong with the network? Well, the answer is that for whatever reason, that user's network experience is showing working v6 and v4 is failing. Because most of the search engines are available over v6, and most of the things they're going to click on through the search engine are not. But the user doesn't know v4 or v6. All they know is search engines work, everything else doesn't. So you need to prep your help desk for kind of being able to look beyond the average or, or, or obvious thing the user is saying and try and find a systematic way to dig into what could possibly be causing this problem in a dual stack world. Here's another problem you're all going to have to deal with as developers. We've all gotten lazy as developers. We all code for single home hosts. We all assume that what we write code for is a machine with a single network connection and a single address and a single protocol. That's very, very easy to write code for. In v6, every host is multi-home. Every host has multiple interfaces. Every host has multiple addresses on each of those interfaces. And the networking environment is much more complex. And you have to account for that in your code. You're going to have to take responsibility for developing a better understanding of how networks work and what they do and how to handle the exceptions that are possible and the more complex network environments that are coming or your code is going to go by the wayside in the very near future because it's not going to work as well as somebody else's that does. Yes, your job's about to get harder. Sorry. Yes? So along those lines, we need to think about that in terms of how I, we I assume OpenStack has a place to file bugs. <laughs> I, I don't have a better answer. Um, the less your API exposes about the underlying network, the less ability you have as an application developer to compensate for what's happening that you don't see. Um, DNS is a perfect example of the kind of opacity that is harmful to the application developer, right? Because when DNSSEC fails, all you get back is DNS failed. You don't know that it failed because it failed to validate the DNSSEC or that it failed because the remote server failed, or it failed because the recursive lookup ran into a wall, right? You, you don't have any visibility into that, so you have no ability to tell the user anything other than, I didn't get a useful answer from DNS, I'm sorry, okay? 
OpenStack is another example of a harmful level of opaqueness in an API. And other than getting the API developer to correct that, I don't have a good answer for solving that. Uh, once something is opaque, you can't see through it. And, you know, I mean, I could say, you know, take a brace and bit and drill a hole, but the, the reality is there's no real physical thing there to drill a hole through. So, so I guess I'm asking a different person. Yes. Yeah. It's opaque about what's happening. The question is, they have an API. It's relatively well-defined. It is apparently incomplete. Uh, and I said, yes, it is apparently incomplete because it is opaque about things that are happening in the network that your application may need to know about in order to provide a better user experience. Yeah, there are a lot of API developers that like to think that. Um, I personally think that if understand, I mean, number one, the reason that they're doing that is because they recognize that most developers are really bad at networking. I'm sorry, but you are. <laughs> okay, I'm a network engineer. I admit that I'm a lousy developer. I mean, the code I put up here, I'm sure you guys could find 10,000 things wrong with it and tell me that it's very poorly written and poorly structured and all of that. I'm sure all of that is true. I tried to make it simple and understandable and I didn't worry about it being the best code you could possibly write, okay? I'm not a developer, I admit it, okay? I'm a good network engineer. You guys are great developers, I'm sure. But you're lousy network people. <laughs> you don't design and build networks well. And you don't necessarily use them all that well in your code. Because you don't necessarily have the deep understanding of networks and how they work and what they do that is necessary to write good networking code, okay? This is just a fact of life, and it's a fact that we need to find a way to change because the networking environment in which your code is going to be operating is becoming more and more complex, not less and less. And as a result, opacity is going to be more and more harmful, in my opinion. Now, because it's becoming more complex, and you guys have done such a lousy job of dealing with the minimal complexity that you've been faced with so far, a lot of the API developers are going, we really need to hide this from the developers now. <laughs> and so they're going in the opposite direction to try and shield you from that complexity. And they're trying to make sure that their API just does the right thing no matter what. The problem is that sometimes the right thing is to tell the user in detail why it didn't work. <laughs> and when you create that kind of opacity, it prevents the code from having any opportunity to do that. So, it's a different philosophy, and, and I'm not an API developer. I'm sure they're good at what they do, but I think they're very, very wrong in this. So what would you advise them to do in the bigger picture of things? Because uh, I see this as a collision course. Yes, it is, absolutely. And, and it, it's actually a collision course around growing network complexity and growing API simplicity. Um, and in my opinion, the correct answer is that APIs need to get simpler in their default behavior, but they need to have that flip down panel that exposes the guts and allows you to ask what happened in detail. And it's really, really hard to write APIs that do that and have them work well. So most API developers really, really hate to instrument their code that way because it's hard and it takes a lot of extra effort. So I don't know that it will happen uh, initially. I think we're gonna have to hit a wall where people start demanding it and where a few APIs get trashed and, and discarded because they don't do that. And then it'll start going the other direction. I think this is one of those pendulum swing things. And I think right now the, the, the API pendulum is headed this way and the network pendulum is headed this way. And one of them's gonna hit a wall somewhere and then they'll come back. So he's asking about SDN. For those of you that don't know, SDN stands for Software Defined Networking. And this is a term which the definition is only slightly less precise than cloud. <laughs> How many people here can tell me what cloud computing is? Okay. One, one person brave enough to raise his hand. How much would you bet that if I actually forced all of you to give me a different definition, there would be at least as many different definitions as there are people in the room. 
Yeah. Um, so that's a nice collection of buzzwords, but it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> it's a great marketing brochure. <laughs> but when we're actually trying to define software, define networking, it doesn't really help. So the best definition I ever heard for cloud computing is, I know my data is somewhere and somebody else is taking care of it. I don't know where, I don't know when, and I don't know how, but I sort of know how to get to it most of the time. <laughs> Software-defined networking is a lot like that. I don't know where my packets are and I don't know how they're getting there, but I kind of know that if I put this address on it and throw it in this bucket, it comes out over there somewhere like it's supposed to and it gets to the machine that, that I put in the address at the front of it. Yeah, a lot like miniature golf. Um, Software-defined networking is the ability to program routers to handle packets in ways the vendors never envisioned. It's basically having the router expose an API that allows you to do your own things to the forwarding table and make the forwarding table magic based on arbitrary categories and, and classifications of packets that you yourself have created and dreamt up. It's a really, really cool feature if you're a network nerd and you have a, a strong desire to tinker with the deep inner guts of a router. It's a really, really great buzzword if you want to sell millions of dollars of hardware and charge extra for it because it has these features to allow your network nerds to tinker with the inner guts of the router. Other than that, I think SDN is mostly a buzzword that doesn't really have all that much meaning other than, you know, Cisco smelling dollars now. I could be wrong. It could take off like cloud has and be this multi-billion dollar industry nobody can explain. But, you know, it's, it's very nebulous. It's very hard to explain what it is. And even the people that are building it can't really give you an accurate definition. So, I don't know what the implications for, for software-defined networking are from all of this. Um, I don't think software-defined networking changes v6 much more than it changes v4. Uh, so, so, I don't think that it's, I think it's a tangential issue that's kind of unrelated to the v4, v6 transition. Any other questions now that I've completely lost everybody by following this rat hole? No? Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Had a great time. Hope you did too.